All right, I think we're ready to begin. Uh, good morning, welcome to our weekly press conference. Um, got uh, our guest this morning from Town of Winona Lake, uh, Town Manager Craig Alba will talk to us about uh, a lot of the goings on and uh, summer activities that are gradually, uh, hopefully, gradually coming back. Uh, and then uh, Dr. Remington will give us his uh, expertise from the health department uh, side of this thing. Um, so I'll, again, start out, uh, again, before we get started on our COVID-related uh, information, I just want to um, talk for just a moment about uh, the protest that was last week held in the community. Um, we had a chance to meet with the organizers and, and uh, um, I think had some very good dialogue and, and the, uh, the gathering on the, the courthouse lawn, there was about 200 folks there. Um, I think there was one in Winona Lake the other, I think on Monday this week, and, and there was approximately 100 people there. Uh, everyone was um, very respectful, very um, uh, behaved, and, and obviously very passionate about uh, the, the problems and the concerns uh, with, their, with their speeches and, and uh, information that they were trying to get out. And, and uh, uh, certainly, I, I know from, on behalf of the city, we feel it's a very important message. And, and, uh, you know, it's stimulating those conversations that need to continue, uh, that can't die, that need to move ahead. And uh, I just would say right now the city is, is in the process of developing its next steps. Uh, so don't have any further answers than that other than we've got a, a laundry list of things we're looking at and, and uh, want to try and, and uh, uh, gear towards that. But again, I was um, very thankful to the organizers that uh, they made it about the, the, the subject matter and, and were um, gave an open mic uh, and uh, was very, um, again, appreciative of, of uh, their approach and I think the effectiveness, I think it made it a, a very effective uh, voice uh, being heard. Um, also appreciate uh, Sheriff Dukes uh, going out on behalf of, of uh, law enforcement and, and uh, giving a word of encouragement as well. So. Um, that being said, let's move into our weekly topic of, of COVID-related uh, issues and concerns. Um, another uh, kudo I do want to make uh, is to the Fairgrounds Board. Uh, I had a chance to meet with them this week. Um, I know they had a very difficult decision to make. I, I think they really looked long and hard at all of their options. Um, they looked at really comprehensive solutions. Uh, certainly, like all of us, didn't want to uh, as Dr. Remington says, pull that lever unless they really felt like they needed to. And um, they asked me for my opinion, and, and I told them, you know, the way the, the governor had laid things out uh, with the road back, it, it, it appeared at the time that that was put together that, you know, large gatherings were going to be allowed. And, and um, you know, uh, after July 4th, it, it initially looked like it might be the right thing to do. But uh, I know that the governor has, has made a few adjustments to his schedule. and. And we'll talk in a minute that he potentially could make some adjustments this week to the phase four, which is set to reopen on, on the 14th. Um, but at any rate, um, the, the fairgrounds board we met, we had a good conversation. And uh, again, I, I feel like they were kind of wanting to, to know my feelings. And uh, I, I just told them, I, I think the biggest issue is trying to uh, control social gatherings outdoors um, where you know, it's hard to control, and um, at the end of the day, they had many, many other factors that they had to, to factor in, um, and, and I, I, they made their decision, and, and I told them I would stand behind their decision, and I do, and uh, again, I just appreciate um, their willingness to sit down and talk about it. Again, real difficult this, uh, decision that all of us are being asked to make. I know Craig is going to talk a little bit about um, some of the things that are, we're holding back on uh, that hopefully we'll be able to open up. Um, you know, we're looking at uh, things like concerts in the park coming back in July. I was asked about uh, Young Tiger football starting up in August, and, you know, everybody's trying to make those adjustments, but, um, you know, none of these decisions uh, are, are permanent. They're subject to change. Uh, that's, that's been the, the toughest part about this. Um, but again, we keep our eye on public health data. We keep our eye on the governor's um, moves that he makes and adjustments that he makes, and we react uh, according to those things. So um, 
again, we're just trying to do the best we can and, and um, slowly uh, make sure we're doing the right thing and not allow this to get out of control. Um, the next item, uh, our, our volunteer fire departments and our, our Warsaw Wayne Township Fire Territory are going to begin delivering some masks uh, to the mobile home parks that have been hardest hit. Um, those will go out probably later this week. Um, Ann Sweet and her group, you've mentioned to me uh, before, I need to get all those names because I know there's a lot of people sewing masks. They're going to have about 300 masks to distribute to uh, a group of the larger, uh, potentially more affected uh, mobile home parks in our, in our county. Um, again, it'll be uh, coordinated uh, distribution through our, our fire departments and appreciate all their work last week with the door hangers and now this week with the um, masks. The masks will not be going door to door. The masks will be dropped off at the uh, offices of these mobile home parks uh, for, for residents to come in. They'll be in plastic bags uh, and they will be dropped off for residents to come and, and grab as they need them. But we will not be delivering them door to door. They will be going to um, these, these parks uh, that are, will identify. Um, again, just a, a little bit about June 14th is, is the stage four. Uh, there are things that we're uh, wanting to do that we're tentatively planning on doing on the 14th, and that would include our, our playgrounds uh, and our, um, our beaches being reopened. Um, again, that's all subject to uh, any potential last-minute changes uh, that the governor and the State Department of Health feel uh, is important to um, adjust those, uh, we will certainly follow that. So tentatively, we are planning on uh, opening our, our beaches on the 14th as well as the um, playgrounds. Um, we know that uh, those are areas that, you know, social gatherings uh, can um, potentially be abused, if you will. Uh, and we're just asking that folks uh, try and use a little bit of discretion um, when they're at the parks, uh, when they're at the beach, try and maintain their social distancing. Um, but again, going by the uh, tenets of the uh, reopening plan, um, you know, this is back on track. This is, this is our city's next step. And uh, if you remember stage three, when, when we're getting ready to open stage three, the last minute the governor took the playgrounds off the list um, and, and we're hoping that won't happen again. But again, I just want everybody to be mindful of, um, you know, what we're looking at here. Uh, and I know Dr. Remington will talk a little bit about the uh, surveillance testing, the random testing, the Fairbanks test that's going on right now uh, might be completed by now and they're going to try and evaluate those numbers. and. I assume those numbers might play into any decision making that the governor announces this week. So we're, we're keeping a close watch on that. Uh, but again, our, our plan is, is to uh, reopen those parks, basketball courts, and, and uh, uh, the beaches on, on the 14th, uh, according to the back on track. Um, last thing I want to talk about was just to remind everybody of the drive through testing that we started a week ago. Uh, MedStat has three locations. Again, just a reminder, this is for county residents only. Um, Warsaw, Syracuse, and Napanee are the locations, but the, those tests are being um, provided for county residents only. Um, I know there's a website. I didn't bring that with me today, but I think MedStat has a website that you can get the hours, uh, which they're pretty broad. Uh, and I know Warsaw is seven days a week. Um, and there's also a, a website where you can actually go on and pre-register if that makes it easier for you. You don't have to do that, but that is, that is an option. So that being said, um, I will uh, turn it over to Dr. Remington. Um, I know uh, we had some concern last week about uh, the mobile home parks, and, and uh, I know the Department of Health has, has been very busy with the increase in cases. Uh, trying to track down, um, you know, any possible um, spread locations, and, and uh, I know we'll hear from him about that. Um, but again, those are uh, really just want you guys to understand how hard the Kosciuszko County Department of Health has been working. 
uh, as these numbers have been going up, their work with the State Department of Health, um, with the local uh, health and, and government folks to, to try and make sure that um, you know we keep control on this, and we're always thankful for their work. So, Dr. Remington. Thank you, Mayor. We uh, are still in the midst of a significant outbreak of COVID uh, for our community. We had our first case on March 26th, and it took us two months to get to the 100th case. It took us a week to get to the 200th case. And we have an additional 50-some cases in the five days in between. But we didn't get another 100 cases in five days, so I'm thankful for that. But this is a significant surge. Uh, we do have a different uh, framework of testing today, but nonetheless, this surge is real and probably more substantial than the surge that we experienced two months ago, but could not test very completely at that time. Uh, the front lines are feeling it a bit, uh, but I don't sense we have a swamped local uh, health resource at this time. We, uh, as you know, have put emphasis on a particular demographic clustering of cases, uh, which the mayor has uh, mentioned, that continues to consume a fair amount of resources for us as we uh, roll up our sleeves and do case investigation and contact tracing. And that demographic clustering is a significant percentage of this uh, surge of cases in the last three weeks. Uh, perhaps, maybe, uh, the fact that we didn't double again in five days uh, is suggesting that it's tapering, maybe, a little bit. Fortunately, we have not seen uh, a popping up of large clusters anywhere else at this time, so that's good news. We will learn more uh, regarding background uh, prevalence of COVID as uh, the Fairbanks and Indiana State Department of Health uh, second wave of prevalence studying uh, gets looked at. The, um, the sampling of, of, I think, another 5,000 people should have finished up Monday, and uh, we hope to see that data within a few days. That, I think, will fold in to whether we feel comfortable going to the next phase with the governor's reopening plan. Uh, that uh, prevalence understanding helps us think in certain ways in public health and for government leaders to, to make good decisions. I think at this point, uh, we need to stay hunkered down to some degree. Um, I am thankful that the fair board canceled the midway in the fair. Uh, we don't know how this uh, surge will look in another two or three weeks, but I, I think any planner of a large event needs to be just really cautious through at least the early part of July. Uh, we think that uh, social distancing, uh, avoiding congregate settings, particularly indoors, but even outdoors, if it's very congregate, those are just fodder for this virus. And we need to try to attenuate that, try to uh, keep those from being uh, a threat in the next several weeks, I believe. Masking, I think, is helpful. Uh, it's not perfect, but uh, please wear a mask when in a congregate setting that you cannot avoid. And if walking into a retail or commercial establishment, please have a mask on. I think it uh, says a lot uh, to those working within the confines of that business. Good hand washing plays in too. Uh, the schools are on my mind quite a bit. This uh, surge of cases is unfortunate timing for our school administrators as they try to think about uh, ramping up for the fall. And uh, this will be very, uh, I think, a very challenging discussion. The Indiana Department of Education uh, came out with a substantial document uh, at the end of last week that uh, I'm sure has been parsed particularly thoroughly by our school administrators. The Indiana State Department of Health will be bringing some guidance to local health departments, including ours, within a few days to help us 
know our place within that document from the Indiana Department of Education. So um, I personally am feeling that issue right now. Uh, again, just as you mentioned, Mayor, we just don't know how this will look in a few weeks. And uh, we've all had to learn to be very flexible within this extremely dynamic uh, pandemic. Uh, so I'm sobered by this outbreak coming late in our COVID experience as a nation. I'm encouraged, perhaps it's tapered off just a little bit, and I'm encouraged, as I mentioned last two weeks, that it's within a, a framework where the, uh, the CDC's nationwide data shows improvement on many fronts. Pop-up regional issues for sure, but overall, uh, the 10,000 foot view on many of their graphics is one of improvement. So even though we're seeing an outbreak now for our county, perhaps this will taper off a little quicker than some of the metropolitan areas experience of two months ago and it won't be as uh, palpable in a terrible way for us as a county. But again, we just, we really don't know. So I wanna be encouraging, but yet very respectful of the moment we find ourselves in Kosciuszko County uh, in regards to this uh, COVID pathogen. So thank you for uh, those of you trying to do the right things, keep, keep it up. But get outdoors, find time to play. Those are all good things. We need them. Thanks. All right, thank you. Um, with regards to your comments on the schools, I, I know uh, we're going to try and get Dr. Uh, Hufford uh, back here. Mm -hmm. Once they've developed their plan, give him a little time to react to that big document and mm -hmm. see how that applies locally. So uh, certainly he will be on uh, then. Um, I did talk to Dr. Cave briefly this morning, and, and they announced yesterday uh, the Grace College has is, is, uh, altered their uh, schedule. They will be starting uh, August 19th, one week early, uh, and they'll finish the fall semester the Friday before Thanksgiving with no breaks, um, similar to what uh, Purdue and Notre Dame have done. So that is their plan now. Uh, I don't have information with regards to any restrictions or, or precautions they are taking. I'm sure they are. Uh, I just can't tell you those, um, and, and I'm sure that uh, his office could talk a little bit about what their plans are for resumption, but uh, he did ask me to mention that uh, they are planning at this point, and again, all uh, everything's subject to change, but uh, they're talking about August 19th, a week early getting started and finishing up the Friday uh, before Thanksgiving. Um, he didn't say, um, well, he didn't say when they will resume. I'm sure that's too far ahead to try and project. So that's from Dr. Kadip. All right, so talking about uh, still being able to try and get outside and have things to do, I know, uh, Craig, a lot of folks look to all the amenities in Winona Lake to uh, recreate, and, and I know you guys have also had a lot of discussions and um, tried to, to be as uh, respectful as you can with uh, getting things started in, in the town of Winona Lake. So. Uh, here's, here's your chance to uh, talk about uh, what you all have done, uh, where we're at now, and uh, where you're heading. Thank you very much, Mayor. And uh, yes, it's true, Grace does have a plan in effect, and, and they're working through that just like most other institutions are. And so um, they continue to work on very fluid um, plans. I uh, want to thank you for inviting um, me over this morning, and uh, appreciate always hearing the updates from Dr. Remington. Uh, sometimes maybe not what we'd like to hear, but uh, but uh, we appreciate uh, the relationship that we've had with uh, Warsaw and also the county. Uh, before I kind of really get started about um, kind of where we are over in Winona Lake, I want to you know try and it's a good thing I'm on a little bit later as far as these uh, news conferences because it seems like things are getting a little more positive, and so um, I just wanted to uh, thank uh, Kedco and the city of Warsaw uh, for the. A grant they received and monies that were put in as well as from the town of Winona Lake for small businesses. Uh, very early on our town council and redevelopment commission um, was really concerned about helping small business of course uh, sooner rather than later and so we jumped on board pretty quick and so I know I've got received a lot of uh, thank yous from the uh, small business owners especially in the village for their rent relief 
and then we put thirty thousand dollars toward that grant to be utilized for other small businesses of Winona Lake and that was very well received and we appreciate the leadership on the county and the city level uh, to get that going. Um, we are on track um, to um, start to reopen some things uh, next week. Um, related to meetings, um, we still are doing uh, virtual meetings. Um, we will probably start to do some uh, experimenting with um, a hybrid uh, virtual and in-person. Uh, we don't want to put uh, either people that are on our various boards or residents of our community or those that may have uh, interest in the agenda item uh, at risk. And so uh, we still will continue to provide uh, Zoom meeting links for our town council meetings as well as any other uh, meetings that might be scheduled. Um, offices are still closed and uh, by appointment only. That's been working out uh, very well. Um, it's taken a us a while, um, like most uh, businesses and municipal offices, to um, be prepared. And so uh, we are working on those things. Uh, right now, we are scheduled to open up to the public, the town offices, um, around July the 4th. But currently, the offices are closed by appointment only. Um, related to the parks, and that's uh, probably the biggest reason why I'm here this morning, um, that we have um, been following the schedule of the governor related to playgrounds and the CDC guidelines. Um, we did open um, things up a little bit um, last time when we were scheduled, uh, like the mayor indicated, to open up the uh, playground, uh, but at the last minute uh, that was put off into stage, uh, the next stage, which is uh, June 14th. So we anticipate opening the playgrounds then. A lot of things go into play when you talk about opening playgrounds. I know the CDC has put information out related to playgrounds, um, just a couple do's and don'ts, if you will. So you want to try and visit your visit parks close to your home. Um, stay within, uh, check with the park or recreation area um, to make sure that it's safe beforehand. Um, find out if bathroom facilities are available. Um, and I'll talk a minute about that. Um, stay at least six feet away from others. Um, the you know, general social distancing and um, help children to also um, follow these rules too. So a lot of times they get uh, wrapped up in, in the recreation and, and don't realize um, that they need to uh, follow these uh, precautions and guidelines. Uh, don't visit the parks if you have uh, COVID-19 um, or you were recently exposed to someone with COVID-19. And then also as our parks get crowded, and this has probably been one of our biggest concerns that, that we've seen um, crowds and when once the playgrounds open that those will uh, increase uh, even more so. Uh, the restrooms, um, one of the things that we struggled with then too um, was opening the restrooms because there's another uh, set of area that you have to uh, have precautions for. Uh, we were able to finally get one open uh, very quickly about 10 days ago and uh, then we got the uh, the older restrooms that are near the Greenway open about a week ago. Um, we had some work to do in there and we hope by the end of today we will have the other restrooms uh, down by the splash pad open also. So we had air dryers in there and so those are kind of not very good for COVID-19 and so we should have by the end of the day um, towel dispensers, paper motion sensor towel dispensers placed in those restrooms. So we'll have a total of those four restrooms plus the two restrooms over by the Greenway. Uh, basketball courts will open on um, June the 14th also. We currently are in the process, and some of this is, might have been good that Playgrounds was put off uh, to the next stage because they're currently doing some construction there and adding some additional equipment. So um, really appreciate the work that Holly has done, our Holly Hummich, our Parks Director and working very closely with Sheila at the Warsaw Parks Department to make sure that um, kind of what goes on in one park system is, is what's going on in the other. So um, there's been great cooperation between, the, between these ladies. Um, Splash Pad is, is scheduled to open on July the 4th. Um, we probably could have opened it by guidelines before now, but we have no way to regulate 50% occupancy and we don't want to have children come to the Splash Pad and say, we're at 50%, you need to go home. So rather than um, disappoint a lot of children, um, 
we put that off until July the 4th, and currently our plan is that we will open the splash pad on July the 4th, and that uh, traditionally is open to Labor Day. I think we're also considering possibly extending that um, maybe another month uh, or depending on the weather. Um, but again, a lot of this, these situations are fluid and are based on the governor's um, back on track plan and any of these plans or what I'm stating this morning could change. Um, one of the things that the governor mentioned when we first started into um, a lot of the shutting down of services was that you needed to get out and exercise and recreate. And so our park and our greenway system has always been open, uh, those parts of the park to the public. And um, initially we had quite a blow up on the um, greenway, a lot of people utilizing the greenway, which was great to see. And I know the uh, bicycle shop has saw uh, increase in bicycle sales. And so that's been one of positive benefits of, um, of the COVID is that people have gotten out and exercised more and maybe connected with more people uh, in, their, in our community and other communities too, uh, as they uh, walk up and down the greenway. We've seen a, a huge uh, increase and initially we had to go out and um, our police have a grant, um, non-motorist grant for pedestrian and bicycle safety. So we uh, just did some friendly reminders and I think for the most part, people were very uh, receptive to um, their being out there. Um, one of the other things that, that we saw a large increase in is the um, mountain bike trails. So the um, mountain bike trails saw an increase in activity. And again, a lot of people had never been on the mountain bike trails before. So there's a, guidelines for mountain bike trails also, that if you're riding a mountain bike, you go the flow of the mountain bikes. And if you're walking or running, you go against the flow uh, because of uh, traffic. And so you wanna make sure that um, you follow their rules and they have posted things since then, but I know they wanted me to reiterate that too. Um, on a, you know, kind of related to recreation, we unfortunately uh, recently found out word and it was reported in the media that um, Zaxter, our um, bicycle um, rental um, share. Sh bike share program was um, terminated um, because they went out of business. And so um, we've been working very closely with the ride walk committee to try and determine how we're gonna replace that. And we are, our, it is our intention to uh, get the bike share back up or get another uh, provider in here as quickly as we can. But on a positive note, um, we did receive word around that same time also that uh, Warsaw Winona Lake also received um, a bronze uh, designation for bicycle friendly community again. Um, it was renewed and um, a lot of hard work has gone into that with the ride walk committee. So the other big thing uh, on the horizon is of course uh, the July 4th activities in Winona Lake. We usually have uh, quite a celebration in Winona Lake and uh, a lot of that occurs around events in the town park, uh, Limitless Park, as well as uh, parades and things like that. Those events will not occur this year. However, um, a committee got together um, near the end of last month uh, discussing about whether we would move ahead with July 4th fireworks, and we felt it was um, that we could do this. Um, again, a lot of it would be subject to change, but uh, the committee decided to uh, move ahead with uh, the scheduling of fireworks for July the 4th. And so as we sit here today, I'm uh, excited to announce, if you didn't know already, that we are still on track for fireworks on July the 4th at approximately uh, 10 o'clock. We also are taking into consideration, again, reinforcing social distancing as we um, approach that uh, date and um, Nick Houck, Managing Director at the Village of Winona, has been a partner in this too, and uh, we'll probably be placing signs, a lot like we have on our Greenway, reminding people of social distancing as we go into people. Of course, Winona Lake uh, sees a great influx of people related to um, the fireworks, and so just to kind of remind people, and this uh, serves as a reminder too, as well as moving ahead, uh, again, uh, like Dr. Remington referred to earlier, when we get outdoors, it's a little bit better, but we still need to maintain the social distancing. Um, we're working on, Winona Lake does have a um, YouTube feed site for the lake, and I know in previous years, or at least last year, I'm almost sure they had um, that feed uh, that, that is a um, 
live feed off the top of the boathouse um, show the fireworks and so we're going to be advertising that there might be some problems right now with the, the video feed but um, that it's a static feed and, and not showing any motion so we're working on that to try and get that corrected in addition I'm going to try and work with uh, maybe another provider to provide another link um, that might uh, be more um, where they might be a little more visible, a little lower to the ground. So we're working on other things to provide an avenue for those that really shouldn't be out and those that maybe don't feel comfortable about being out, uh, those that are high risk. So give them an opportunity to uh, view the fireworks um, in a safer setting. So we're gonna try and provide some alternative um, viewing of those fireworks too. Um, we will be talking and have had some brief conversation with the fairgrounds already um, and trying to get people, people previously had uh, gone to the fairgrounds, um, kind of again practicing those social distancing and some people have been into the uh, grandstands too so um, that's another concern especially when in the grandstands um, for that social distancing. So that's kind of the latest on the July 4th fireworks plan. Again, very fluid situations, and uh, we're very uh, excited and hopefully confident that we can uh, pull this off, uh, but we, again, always need the uh, public's cooperation in uh, wearing masks and uh, social distancing um, and following those best practices. The other event that is going to occur that evening is the um, concert at eight o'clock. There's traditionally a concert that goes on, a more patriotic concert, and that has also been scheduled. They were kind of working in conjunction with the town to determine uh, what they needed to do. And they're gonna be having a little bit bigger tent and um, they're gonna be practicing social distancing for the orchestra. And of course the audience, uh, they need to also be practicing social distancing. So they have a working on a plan in place, uh, primarily for those that play the wind instruments. Uh, we think the stringed instruments can probably wear a mask, uh, but we're leaving that up to that uh, group, but we're excited that they're also uh, moving ahead with the concert at eight o'clock. So um, again, I wanna thank uh, Dr. Remington for his leadership. Um, I'm sure I'll leave people out, but also thanks to the uh, public safety personnel and our dispatchers sometimes um, they're left out of it uh, with the background of law enforcement. Uh, you know, sometimes we don't um, mention them probably as much as what they should, but we really appreciate the work they've done. Uh, the healthcare officials, not only um, those that work in our hospitals and our doctors and nurses, but also those that are working in our nursing homes. I know my wife, um, my mother-in-law is in, um, uh, a nursing home and uh, it's been a real um, challenge these last three months they finally or she finally got in to see her uh, last week last Saturday and so um, these are kind of really unsung heroes that are putting in a lot of time under very difficult circumstances and then again thank you mayor for inviting me this morning and city and county officials as we work through this um, pandemic thank you Craig I, I know you all have been working hard and you're right, you get a little bit of an advantage being later on because you can kind of work through a lot of this. Uh, early on, it was just a lot of trying yeah. to keep up with the changes and understand what's next. But uh, So um, I think we've covered a pretty fair amount of territory here this morning. Let's uh, open it up for questions. Dave Sloan, Times Union. Um, Dr. Remington, um, yesterday at the county commissioner's meeting, uh, Custis County Senior Services D Director David Neff was talking about the whole impact on senior citizens, how they're depressed, how they are uh, gaining weight, and how some of them can't even formulate words because they've been so isolated. What have you been seeing, and how do you, and how can the community deal with that, or can they, or is it, because the senior citizens are gonna be the last to be out to go on the public, so what are, what are you seeing, I guess? <coughs> That observation is absolutely correct, and it resonates uh, strongly with me, a, a private primary care physician with a significant geriatric population. I have felt that in the exam room just this morning. Uh, we need to find ways to connect with uh, the vulnerable aspects of the population, particularly our older 
uh, members of the community. I think uh, one of the increasingly discussed issues that I am feeling increasingly passionate about is that we probably need to rethink the extreme reduction of visitation that has gone on in healthcare facilities and nursing homes. That, that has been really rough. And I think one of the lessons learned from this pandemic will be how to figure this out a little differently so that we do not create the problems that, that you mentioned. So whether it's an inpatient hospital stay, a nursing home stay, these vulnerable moments of our life, we need an advocate at our side, we do. And uh, socially we need it, medically it's good to have that. Um, and I think now, what I have seen in documentation to me from the State Department of Health regarding nursing home visitation is that they have been seeing this and they are loosening it up a bit to allow protected visitation. Uh, so look for that. For family members with a loved one in a nursing home or hospital stay, find uh, a way to connect. Really go out of your way to try to do that. That's a great question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Along that line, I, I've got a neighbor who's going to be able to see her mother for the first time in three months. And uh, her mom is over in Fort Wayne, and, and they're going to... All the family members will be there. They'll be socially distanced. They'll all have to wear masks, but they're going to allow them to mm -hmm. come face to face and, and have those discussions and, and uh, that warmth that's that's so desperately needed. You know, I think we remember talking right from the beginning. Um, besides the importance of taking care of yourself with all these uh, social distancing measures, but you know, check in on your family, check in on your neighbors. Um, still continues to be something that's important, especially um, elderly neighbors that are alone. I know, I'll throw my mom into this, I know mom just likes seeing us and hearing from us, and it has been a little bit less than, than we normally do, and I know how lonely it makes her feel. Um, she lives alone, and, and, and that's, it's not easy. Um, I know we had uh, uh, Kirk Carlson from Bowen Center last week kind of addressing more general mental health issues, but uh, David, you're exactly right. The, elderly that are especially living alone the isolation is is, um, is tough mm -hmm. so good question thank you mr spaulding from uh, ink free news uh, dr Remington, could you give us an update on the drive-through testing do you have a feel for how successful that is and also um i forgot my follow-up go ahead with that right i think uh Again, kudos to the mayor and others who quickly s helped us swing public health resources to this sector, this demographic sector in our county that really saw a case count increase. And uh, I, th I believe it's, it's been a, one of the best interventions I've seen uh, in this whole thing. I believe, I, I don't have numbers for you, unfortunately, but I know our testing has gone significantly up with a fair amount of positives in the last f few days within that demographic base. So I think we're getting testing to where we wanted to get it uh, to help make right decisions with isolation and quarantining. Uh, and we'll continue to look for those kinds of opportunities in our health department and our communicable disease staff, Teresa Reed and uh, Nicole, will be really looking for the footprint of another place we need to be in the county in a focused swing of resources, just like we did over the last two weeks. Um, <clears throat> so I think the testing has been good. Thanks for uh, county and city leaders bringing CARES Act funding to that. I think it was very helpful, a good thing to do. Uh, and our intervention goes beyond the testing, of course, but uh, that's a strong piece. And it demonstrates, I, th I think, to uh, sectors of, of the population where we have seen an issue that, that this is a, a real issue and it allows us some opportunities for discussion. So it's not just the test itself necessarily, but the whole thing that goes around the testing that's very good from a public health perspective. Has the county 
philosophy kind of resumed its contact tracing role? More so, than the so I my directive to our staff has been as long as resources allow, we're we're going to be in this. Uh, again, trying to find the right dovetailing in with the state contractor that's uh, doing uh, case investigation and contact tracing. We, we must dovetail in with that, but uh, we are, again, trying to take that, that step back, looking for uh, clusters and swinging resources there. So we're very active with it. We're spending lots of man hours on that. We're swinging additional staffing uh, to our two people <laughs> that do this and uh, putting more people on the phone. And uh, so we are not just laying over and saying, well, this is a state problem now. Uh, we're, we're invested. Also, could you give us a feel for um, what percentage of all these new cases have, have led to hospitalizations? Yeah, I don't, I don't have that percentage, but I do know there's been uh, a surge of cases to our local hospital, a handful. And we had a handful two months ago. So whether this is worse than two months ago is really hard to, I, I don't have perfect means of quantitating that. And in the absence of the, the testing two months ago, like we're doing now, it's really hard to compare this experience now with two months ago to perfectly know if this is worse or not. I think it is, but it's, uh, that's just anecdotal as much as data driven. And I've had this very conversation with Teresa Reed, my chief uh, communicable disease nurse, and she likewise had uh, the same judgment. A little hard to compare, uh, but this is definitely a real surge now. Yeah. So I'm glad we have more access to testing. Everybody should find access to a test. Um, and if you meet those criteria for testing, again, again largely people with symptoms, uh, close contacts of a, of a strongly suspected or confirmed case, and then certain high-risk demographics, uh, even without symptoms, should be tested. So the list, again, slowly grows uh, of whom we test, and all that springing from the availability of testing. There still is, uh, apparently, an occasional inability to get nasopharyngeal swabs, which is still the best specimen, as obnoxious as it is, the sensitivity of that test beats a spit test or just a quick snob, a quick uh, swab from the front of your nose. Uh, you lose sensitivity with those techniques. Uh, and there still are supply chain issues with those nasopharyngeal swabs, apparently. So. With the uh, increase in uh, cases, are we seeing an increase with healthcare workers in COVID? I have not heard that anecdotally, and I don't have that metric. Um, there have, have been a case here and there all along uh, among healthcare workers. Uh, whether we are seeing a substantial surge now, I have not heard that in my conversations. I've not seen that on a, a metric that's landed in my lap. The, the potential for healthcare workers to develop COVID has been a real issue. It's one of the topics from the chief medical officer in her weekly webinar uh, Friday. There's increasing data nationwide about that, so that, that's a timely topic. Since you expressed uh, appreciation for the fact that the fair board canceled fair, I'm wondering how much hesitation do you have about the 4th of July activities and what's your advice? Well, I, uh, I think the caution that I hear in the way Craig describes how they're going to approach the event at Winona Lake, uh, that sounds better to me. Again, this is very personal and anecdotal, than a, and I love the fair, but it sounds better to me than the crowded midway where we spend a whole afternoon there in crowded venues at the fair sometimes, the merchant's tent, other vendors' tents. Uh, those are crowded, you're shoulder to shoulder so often. Not that you can't be standing at the lakeside watching the fireworks, and um, that'll be a tricky to try to encourage that. But again, clusters of people 
tightly knit together of some duration is a big piece that's prevailing in the discussion points of how this virus spreads. So if there are ways to mitigate it without entirely shutting down what we love to do and uh, the way we love to go out to eat or conduct our businesses, we gotta find that, that way. Fourth of July is important for all of us and I think we need a positive thing about that time. So I am not opposed to a 4th of July celebration with some precautions. And I would suggest that if you are someone with an underlying medical condition, if you are elderly, I would strongly encourage you to think carefully about attending an event like that. I think that's the, 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 the big difficulty with this reopening. You know, there, there's going to be for many people, common sense will prevail. Um, you've got committees that spend a lot of time planning events and have to make decisions based on um, financial aspects, i.e. the contract needs to be signed by a certain date. Um, you know, you, you look at all of those things, uh, then you look at the public health data, and, and you just have to try and go individually, case by case, uh, make the decision that uh, everyone I've talked to about their decisions are, you know, I would, I would save your decision to the last minute till you have to sign that contract. If you can get a COVID clause put into that contract, which I know we did for a few of the concerts in the park, um, you know, obviously that's going to be to your benefit, but you have to realize that, that things are, are continuing to change. Uh, I'd mentioned Young Tiger football. You know, they're talking about precautions now. That's not scheduled to start till August. Uh, the concerts in, in, at the plaza in the park aren't scheduled to start till mid-July. So, you know, those discussions are ongoing. Um, and again, it, they're based more on the nature of, of where people are going to gather, how they're going to gather, the duration, where we stand. Um, it, it's it's just hard trying to see into the future. You know, we, we've got a... a a blueprint from the state uh, that we is, is foundational, um, but I, I give a lot of kudos uh, to Craig, the decisions they made in Winona Lake, uh, the decisions we've had to make here to maybe delay some things even though the, the blueprint says go ahead. Uh, we've got uh, chief health officer telling us that, you know, we've, we've got this surge going on now. Uh, is it more testing? Probably some of it is, but um, at the end of the day, there, there's, it's probably a little bit more than that. So um, that balance of, of returning to normalcy, of uh, people, the, it really comes back to, to people um, practicing a lot of these social distancing, masks, hand washing, the things we've talked about from day one, and just you know, kind of using uh, their own situations to uh, apply to what they're going to do, where they're going to go, what their uh, situation they're gonna put themselves in. It's, that's, that's the tough part. Um, creating opportunities for these social gatherings that you may not be able to control, uh, that's probably our biggest concern and where we're taking, uh, looking the most serious at, at you know, what events um, can go on. And, and you know, even at the end of the day, to me, it's, it's up to those individuals putting those events on. Uh, obviously, the city events that you know, we're taking responsibility for but, you know, there's so many things, you know, the fireworks, the, um, the wagon wheel theater, you know, the, the fair. I mean, those are big parts of our community um, that I, I think at the end of the day, uh, there's been decisions that have been made that are very difficult. Um, but I think we're getting it right so far. Yeah, the, the beaches are a real concern, you know, for both of our communities, too, because of the you know, the closeness, it's a little bit different maybe than fireworks where they're traditionally spread out because they don't want the sparklers to hit their neighbors or watching the fireworks. But, you know, so what's an issue in Winona Lake is our beach is a lot smaller. And so it's pretty hard to get a lot of good social distancing on as small of a sandy area as we have. Even Warsaw has a little bit bigger area, but still when you put an influx of people on a 90 degree day, there just isn't enough beach for anybody. Um, so that's why it's probably good to move out into the park somewhere else and, and get off the beach and try and, again, reinforce that closeness um, 
and so the beaches will always be a challenge, especially in our community, to try and get people to parents um, to instruction of children and, and, and create that distance. So fortunately, we're in the warm climate right now. Um, that helps a little bit, my understanding, but still that's that's a, a tough area when you want to have people get out and recreate and enjoy our lakes and, and streams that we have here in Kosciuszko County. I think we've all learned through this. I, I know Dr. Remington just mentioned it about visitation at uh, extended care facilities. You know, maybe looking back, um, we'll have a playbook for this the next time. Hopefully there won't be a next time, but if this does ever happen again, um, we might have a little bit of a playbook. But, you know, we're just trying to do the best we can with the public information we have, understanding the needs of the public, including myself. You know, I want to go to football games this fall. Doesn't look like I'm going to be able to, but I really want to go to football games. You know, everybody's got the things they like to do. And, you know, you tell a, a young family that they can't go to the beach. It's like putting an ice cream truck in front of their house and saying, sorry, you can't have any of that. I mean, it's just, it's, how do you manage um, those those issues and um, we're not perfect and, and when we look back I'm sure we're going to acknowledge that mistakes were made but um, I, I think we're trying to use the information that we have um, and, and not trample on folks civil liberties uh, just try and get everybody to understand that it's a, it's certainly a community wide process to try and, and keep this spread down and uh, it, it's it's been a challenge but I, I think we've handled it well, um, but not perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Remington, I was wondering if you could kind of talk about with this recent outbreak and the severity of the symptoms that some have been exhibiting. What have you heard on that? Are they still on the mild side from what we saw originally? Are they more severe this time around? And then if with anything that's been going on the past three weeks, if you've been hearing anything on recovery. It's not necessarily like a number, but mm -hmm. if people are still also on that recovery mm -hmm. track as well. Great question, Nick. And I just had this conversation with Teresa Reed this morning. And uh, so we sense that this surge, most of the cases have fortunately been fairly mild with occasional rough ones, uh, which is what we experienced two months ago. So you know, two months ago, we would have told these people stay home, there's no test available, we wouldn't have tested you. So it's the same thing. Uh, I don't sense this is something on uh, orders of magnitude more aggressive than what we experienced two months ago. I think it's a matter of volume. When you get enough cases, you will see X percentage have rough outcomes, particularly among those that we know uh, are at greater risk for rough outcomes, the older people and those with pre-existing illnesses. Uh, so most of these patients, this surge, uh, are ambulatory. They're staying at home. We have no drug to give them, no shot to give them, no vaccine, obviously, uh, but uh, encouraging them to stay home if they're ill. And that's one of the things I, I really want to emphasize and haven't mentioned this morning is that if you are ill, stay home. The most significant spreaders are probably, probably those who are ill. There are asymptomatic shedders, we know that. And there are people who carry the RNA in their front of their nose if you do serial testing on them for weeks, but not necessarily contagious. So testing is nuanced. But if you are ill with COVID, you are likely the most contagious those early days of your illness, just like the way we think with influenza. Maybe shedding the virus a day or two ahead, and then most profusely, a handful of days after that, during your symptomatic period. So if you are ill with a cough and fever, shortness of breath, my goodness, stay home. If you're very short of breath, of course, seek medical care. Uh, this respiratory virus is still circulating in the community. Maybe it's a minor question, but talking about reopening the beaches, 
in the past, it's been difficult to get lifeguards. Will there be lifeguards, and will they have to take extra safety precautions? At this point, we aren't um, going to be having lifeguards. You will be swimming at your own risk, and I'll let the mayor, but again, we're trying to mirror what Warsaw is doing. We don't have, um, you know, a, some of the issue with lifeguards is that uh, lifeguards we traditionally would have hired uh, earlier in the season have already uh, found jobs. And then the other thing is we can't possibly control that. And then the third thing is, um, you're going to get into situations where the lifeguard's out there and someone's on the beach and thinks somebody else is too close and so then the lifeguard's going to be the one that they're going to go to to try and get this other person to move or you know something there so we're just again recommending best practices uh, and at this point at least uh, we've had a lot of serious discussion about this and i'm not saying um we aren't, but we are not at this point. And because of the shortness of the season, then by the time we were to get started, um, then it would be over anyway. And a lot of those students are probably going back to college or going back to school. And also now with school, even at least college is starting um, a week or two earlier, you know, that, that your pool is just so limited. That, um, so that, that's some of the struggles we've run into. Um, and so we'll just kind of have to work through things as, as we move along, but at this point we are not, and I believe that's the case in Warsaw. Yeah, we've had difficulty uh, just hiring lifeguards, finding people that, that want to apply. Last year we had, uh, I don't believe, we may have had a few, but our, our lifeguarding was very limited at the beaches. Uh, it was pretty much a swim at your own risk, uh, and I suppose that sign takes a double meaning this year, um, swim at your own risk and sit on the beach uh, somewhat at your own risk. Just again, uh, that underscores the importance of taking the responsibility uh, to keep watch on your kids when they're in the water uh, and, and to do that social distancing that uh, you know is, is required of, of social gatherings at this point. Um, but we again plan on uh, no lifeguards this year, it'll all be swim at your own risk. That's important too, Mayor, because you know previous to this year, it's it's pretty tough to find lifeguards sometimes too, and then also those lifeguards have to be trained and so, or retrained or recertified. So a lot of those lifeguards that were tough to get before are even tougher now, and the recertifications haven't been taking place. I know we have some water quality pool testing that we do uh, related to the splash pad that we weren't able to do yet this year because. Um, they didn't offer the classes, so those are all things that come up and make it tough to, to do certain things. Yeah, and to underscore what Craig said, you know, we're not going to be out um, patrolling and, and uh, enforcing uh, any of these restrictions. You know, we, we've held our uh, standards that, that, you know, the expectation has been somewhat um, very apparent uh, these that's part of the purpose of these weekly press conferences and information we've gotten out on social media that uh, folks know in our community you know what the expectation is not only locally but statewide and, and even nationally and you know that's how we try and manage this and not by going out and, and uh, you know as we've joked a little bit about being the mask police um, you know there's <laughs> plenty of comments on social media about people uh, saying that the don't like going into the grocery store when other people aren't wearing the masks and you know maybe that's an effective way to, to take care of it but uh, most important thing is we're still uh, reliant on the uh, wisdom of of, uh, of our citizens to take this thing seriously and, and again in the midst of a little bit of a bump here um, I, I don't know that there's a, any better time to have taken this thing seriously than it is right now First off, let me say, I, I think it's a great public service the county provides these virus numbers every day. With that said, every day we post these and the trolls come out on social media and there's this general theme that it's fake news pushing a political agenda. How disheartening is that and, and what, do you have a message for those people? Well, <clears throat> it's real. Um, I respect 
uh, the injury that can come to an individual with these novel respiratory viruses. I'll never forget this anecdote. I tell a lot of my patients this in the office. I was in training in a big metropolitan tertiary care hospital working the ICU. And this 24-year-old construction worker came in. And he had an increasing oxygen requirement. We eventually had to put him on a vent. And he got worse. His chest x-ray got worse and worse. He died, 24 years old. He, and this was when HIV was new. Uh, didn't have AIDS. We didn't find a chink in his armor. Healthy, robust guy. I swung over to the uh, infectious disease rotation the following month, and I'll never forget his post-mortem case conference. His uh, photograph of his lungs were horrific. The only pathogen they identified in that 24-year-old healthy guy was influenza A. Never forget that case. So these bugs do this. And I can't remember if that year, I think that was a year where it was a novel strain. I didn't know much about that then. Uh, so H1N1 was bad. This is really bad. It, it really happens. Be thankful you haven't seen it up front, and so this is all a hype or some parody by the government or something to you. That tells me you're fortunate. Uh, these are random events sometimes. We, again, we know certain demographics are more at risk now with this one. But it's a real deal. It's all about the statistical pressure of these things. And it's when a new virus leaves its animal or avian host and enters the human population and shows efficient and ongoing transmission that you really open your eyes to the potential evil because it really can occur. That event a century ago was not a made up event. I'm glad this one doesn't look like that, but it's been close enough to get our attention. And I quit reading my face. I, I did Facebook briefly and got out of it after my wife told me these stories. And I said, no more. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't, I don't even want to hear them anymore. Hmm. All right. Well, we're, we're out of time. I <laughs> uh, appreciate uh, Craig coming over from town of Winona Lake. And hopefully we're continuing to, to move ahead guardedly. But uh, we're getting there. Dr. Remington, as usual, we're thankful for your expertise and wisdom and, and um, you represent the to me the the data driven um, actions that we take are, are based on on that information that you're giving us and uh, we'll continue with that um, I will not be here next week but we will have a press conference uh, Commissioner Kerry Groninger uh, will host the press conference and I think as I mentioned uh, before we started we will continue weekly press conferences at least through the July 4th week when we're scheduled uh, to, to reopen totally. Um, I assume we may continue on uh, in some form. Uh, it may not be weekly, it may be two weeks, but at this point we're going weekly uh, up through the 4th of July. So thank you again for uh, uh, attending and, and uh, viewing today, and, and uh, as usual, uh, stay safe. Thank you. <laughs>